Thank you for that introduction. So it's an honor to be here today and to, uh, to round out this balustrade hour. Uh, my, my presentation is going to combine the first two, so the, the look at all the calculation methods plus all the testing as well. So as we've seen, balustrades are becoming very popular in, in the industry. From beautiful scenic views of, of city skylines to breathtaking ocean gazes, balustrades are everywhere. And until just recently, in the, in the North America at least, monolithic tempered glass was predominant. It was allowed to be everywhere. So the 2012 International Building Code only stated that monolithic tempered glass could be used for anywhere, even for cantilevered or, or minimally supported glass balustrades. Of course, fully tempered laminated glass could be used or heat strengthened laminated glass could be used as long as all three complied with the safety standards, which is just the, the pendulum impact from ANSI or the CPSC. But then in 2010 to 2011, there were over 30 cases of glass falling in Toronto, falling off the buildings onto the sidewalk below, in some cases injuring the pedestrians. But this wasn't just in Toronto, it was other cities as well, like Houston or Dallas. Investigating the root cause of these failures, the, pr the predominant issue was nickel sulfide inclusions. A lot of the glass was coming from other, other countries and, and they had the nickel sulfide in it. Of course, some other, other reasons were the removal of the top rail, or the system just wasn't really designed all that well. Laminated glass was an option, but it's usually value injured, engineered out since monolithic tempered is cheaper. So in 2015, after a lot of work, the new International Building Code now mandated that laminated glass should be used for balustrade applications with the only exception being that if the walkway below was protected or if there was no walkway below. So it still did not protect the people on the, ballast, on the balcony, just the people below. Some other, load requ some other requirements from the International Building Code are the, uh, the panels have to be designed to a safety factor of four so this safety factor four, like Adam asked just recently, is on the ultimate stress, not on the load itself. So you don't multiply the load by four. For the loads, we have a linear load of 50 pounds per linear foot of, or 0.73 kilonewtons per meter, and a concentrated load of 0.89 kilonewtons. In addition, there's also a wind load requirement, and in high-velocity wind zones, also the hurricane impact is, is required as well. For the support, the code mandates that a minimum of three glass balusters has to have a, a top rail. It's that way if one glass light breaks, the top rail is still supported by two others. But this, there was an exception to remove this top rail and that exception was that it had to be laminated glass of two or more lights that are equal thickness, and it had to have the written approval of the building official. So this created some confusion in the industry and some issues where one project could have the top rail removed, but another project maybe a few miles later or another city couldn't have it removed. So in 2018, the version of IBC removed the building official approval and in place of that put the clause that it has to pass the ASTM E2353 test, which is, base, is a pendulum impact test and it's a shot bag, so it's the, the soft body impact and a hard body impact as well. The glass must remain standing and cannot have a hole in it where a sphere can pass through. 
So this brought us to our testing, our program in this presentation here. We wanted to answer two basic questions. One, how does modeling, finite element analysis, the ASTME 1300 equation, how does that compare to actual live results, live testing? And two, how does the inner layer affect this post-breakage impact? So some of the variables that we looked at were dry glaze systems. We saw earlier in the presentation all of those dry glaze systems for European. Uh, so this one we used CRL's taper lock. Also wet glazed with Sika's GG735. For the glass dimension, since it was a small study, we just looked at a one-to-one -one ratio, about one meter to one meter. And the temperature, this was in, in Texas, so the laboratory was air conditioned to 20 degrees C. Uh, the laminates that we tested were all eight millimeter fully tempered, plus eight millimeter fully tempered with 1.52 inner layer. And we tested standard PVB, stiff PVB, and the onomer. So for the modeling, this was the easy part. So I used the SJ Mepla program. And I also used the linear load formula from ASTM E1300. In SJ Mepla, I modeled it as a sandwich structure, a layered structure, and as well as the effective thickness from the E1300 formula. There are different types of support conditions in Mepla, and so I picked three of them. The first one I picked is this one right here, which is almost a fully clamped, and then number five as well. And speaking with Mepla, they actually recommend using a linear elastic support system, which is basically this one right here. Uh, it consisted of 100 millimeters of support at the bottom, bait made with five lines that were 20 millimeters thick, uh, and the, the modulus for the material of the elastic was, that I used was 30 Newton millimeters per squared. For the inner layer shear modulus, I used our published values. For PVB is 1.2 Newton millimeters squared. SIF PVB was 120, and ionomer was 192. So this was at 20 degrees C and one minute load duration. The linear load that was used was 0.73 kilonewtons per meter. And this was perpendicular to the top of the glass, pushing, pushing against the glass. And for the concentrated load, I used 1.33 kilonewtons. Now, this is different than what's in the IVC. Because in the ASTM E 2353, for this type of system that's cantilevered with no top rail, it recommends a, a, a larger load for the concentrated load. This one was, the concentrated load was in the center of the glass and at the top, pushing the glass over. Normally I would put it at the edge, but since the laboratory couldn't move the the location of the load, they could only do it in the center. I modeled it in the center as well. So here are the results from the, the modeling study. This is for the concentrated load. For the stiffer inner layers, stiff PVB and ionomer, the values were pretty consistent, except for the layered support five. But all the others were about 19. 18 to 19. For the softer PVB, it was a different story. The effective thickness with support one and five were similar to the, the layered linear elastic, but all the rest were pretty variable. For the linear load, it was pretty cons Pretty, pretty much the same as the concentrated for this in, the stiffer inner layer, stiff PVB and ionomer. They were all pretty close, except for the layered support five. For the softer PVB, they were pretty random, 
but the effective thickness method from, from ASTM for PVB matched the layered elastic and the effective thickness support one and effective thickness support five. But so it was some similarities there. So that was the easy part. Now we come to the testing, and it just went downhill from there. So we were looking at the dry glaze system, like I said, as well as the wet glaze system, the linear load, the concentrated load. For the uh, dry glazed system, we had four paper locks, four places where it was held in place. And we followed the manufacturer's instructions of having at least 2.5 centimeters from the edge on both of these. And then the two middle ones were 35 centimeters centered. And here is the setup. More about the setup in a little bit. <laughs> and, and this is the I-beams that the base shoes were supported on. Uh, in addition to the, the two loads, we also did the impact loads at the end, the soft body and the hard body, uh, as well as a post-breakage concentrated load. So for the linear load testing, we had a bracket made that went on top of the glass. And it was, you could see it up here. Uh, it was about, it was the length of the glass and it was only about 38 millimeters down from the glass, so it was a pretty thin load, a line, and it weighed, it was pretty heavy, it weighed 24 kilograms. The load was applied for 60, min 60 seconds, um, and it was done with a pneumatic ram. And then we took deflection measurements at three locations, at the top of the glass, right above the base shoe on the glass, and then underneath on the I-beam, right here. So the same for the concentrated load. We had a smaller bracket made that went in the center, and it was 292 millimeters long, and again, only about 38 millimeters down from the top of the glass. The load, again, was applied for 60 seconds, and we, still, we again had all of the deflection measurements at the same spot. So here's our test results. As I said, everything went downhill after the, the modeling. The results were all over the place. And there's a lot of reasons why. But I'll get into that in a second. So how does, how do, does the results compare to our modeling? So I took the best results that we got and compared it to the modeling. So for the concentrated load, the stiff inner layers were OK, not too bad, um, you know, 10 millimeters or so away. But for the softer PVB, not so much. However, for the linear load, it was a different story. The stiff inner layers, they were much closer you know, three to six millimeters difference. So I only, by the way, I only measured the deflection because the lab didn't have any strain gauges to measure the stress, so, so we didn't do any stress, just deflection. Um, but for PVB, it did a little better too. It was, you know, 10 millimeters or so, even two millimeters in one case. So to summarize the testing versus the modeling, uh, in general, the differences, OK. There were 3 to 15 millimeters in most cases. Uh, the linear load had a better correlation with the modeling. Uh, the concentrated load uh, had a higher difference, especially with the PVB. Some possible causes for this, uh, as, as we just heard earlier in one of the questions about how was the base shoe supported, so the base shoe was bolted to this I-beam, and we noticed that these bolts here that connected this I-beam to this I-beam, 
kept loosening every time we would apply a load or an impact. So we had to tighten them every single time, which got pretty tedious. In addition, we had to tighten the bolts that put the, the base chute onto the I-beam. So that also got tedious. The first time we tried impacting, the lab thought, oh, this huge I-beam here would, is strong enough, it's heavy enough. The impact actually lifted the whole unit over and moved it about 10 centimeters. It's a pretty major impact. So the lab then bolted it down to the, to the cement. Um, so yeah, one other thing that we did was we welded a gusset onto the I-beam here to prevent the I-beam from, from rolling. Unfortunately, this was at the, towards the end of our testing and only a few samples actually got tested with that. So now we move on to the impact performance. So according to E2353, there's two pendulum impactors. One is the soft body. So this is the 45 kg shot bag that's dropped from a height of 1.22 meters. Uh, so for this one, according to the standard, it has to be impacted close to the top and in the center of the glass. So maximum impact there. There's a hard body impactor with a small round metal ball at the tip that impacts the glass. Uh, this one was 11 kgs and it was dropped from a height of 0.9 meters. So it delivered a 100 joule impact force. So what we wanted to know was, does it break during impact? Does it remain standing if it breaks? And then after it breaks, because if it didn't break, we broke it manually, we wanted to see how much force it would take to pull the laminate over. Okay. So here's the video Three, of two, the one. impact. That's the soft body impact. Sorry, the video is a bit shaky. That was for the ionomer, so you see it didn't break for that one. And this is the hard body impact for the ionomer. So the hard body impact did break it, uh, but it remained standing after breakage. So one question answered. Uh, for SIF PVB, it too remained standing. Uh, it, it didn't break with the soft body, and coincidentally, it didn't break with the hard body as well. Uh, and this one is the soft body impact for the PVB, eight millimeter over eight millimeter. That one broke and fell right over. So that one did not pass this testing. Uh, the next video is the post-breakage load. So we put the concentrated load back on it and started pulling. This is with the stiff PVB. So after a certain point, the laminate just gives out and starts to fall on itself and falls onto the chain. After we took the, uh, the chain off of it, it just continued to fall down. And here's a picture of, of afterwards. Uh, so what we determined is that PVB, of course, we knew wasn't going to pass. Stiff PVB and the onomer both, uh, after the impacts and after being broken, both would stand up. But then on the post-breakage load, the onomer was able to withstand almost double the load that the stiff PVB was able to withstand. So about 490 newtons versus 285 newtons. So in conclusion, some of the things that we learned was that the, the layered and effective thickness produce similar results um, for the linear elastic and the support one conditions uh, for the stiffer inner layers. Uh, the effective thickness for, for PVB uh, and support one and five were similar to the layered um, elastic approach, linear elastic. Uh, for the linear load, 
Uh, it was it was pretty good. The E1300 formula for the line load produced similar results to the layered and the um, elastic uh, support conditions. Um, the linear load testing showed similar results to the modeled values for the stiff inner layers, uh, whereas the concentrated load a mm, little bit a little bit different. The stiff inner layers passed the 2353 impact tests. Uh, after being broken, and the ionomer was about twice as strong as the stiff PVB on the post-breakage load. Uh, this was all done at 20 degrees C, so you know we probably need to redo that at, at different temperatures. Uh, some of the other things we learned is the the mounting to of the base shoe is very very important, and probably next time it should be done directly into concrete with a bit more. Uh, <laughs> strength. Um, so yeah, so that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Juan, for this uh, interesting study. Uh -huh. So I understood that there was some bad luck involved with the setup from the, from the lab people, but hopefully they will improve next time. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, interesting to see that the stiff PVB is already so weak, even at uh, quite low temperature scenario of 20 degrees C. So at uh, elevated uh, scenarios, 30 or even 50 degrees C, it would be would be even more weak, weaker. So uh, maybe we have to study this uh, behavior a little bit more. But are there any questions from the audience? Richard Green, please. Oh no. <laughs> hey, Vaughn. Hey, Great Richard. Work. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if there is any comparison of the uh, inherent tensile strength of the three materials that were tested versus thinking of it as being like reinforced concrete where you've got a compression edge. I'm thinking about the post-damage pullover load and the tensile strength of the material as a direct tensile test inherently and relating that to what you'd get as if it was, you know, compression tension couple right. at the moment. So I, I really didn't focus too much on the post breakage part. I was looking more towards just how did you know modeling of, of a non broken laminate uh, look. Uh, but it would be an interesting thing to, to look at and see how does this how does this work? Because uh, post breakage performance, post breakage strength is definitely a topic uh, that would be great if we could figure out a way to model it or to calculate it and, and to you know, for the industry, it would be a great thing. So I don't know, it's something we could, we could discuss further afterwards. Hi there. Did you like what you just saw? If you did, why don't you like the video, drop us a comment below, and share the video as well, since GPD is all about sharing. And to receive more videos in future, subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to click the bell icon. Ciao.